Because what's really happening today, to call out the essence of, of the real problem, is that government is using private companies to do through the back door what government could not get done directly through the front door under the Constitution. Thank you. They're using threats to private companies to take down disfavored political speech. They give you carrots, like Section 230C2 protection that gives you a federal blanket of immunity if you go down and live as a lad boy on the back for what the government wanted you to do instead. Anyway, White House officials calling officials from Twitter in, telling them specifically to take down by name, I'm not making this up now, by name individuals like Alex Behrens and others who are critics of the government. If there's one thing that makes George Washington roll over in his grave, it is the idea that the federal government would silence a critic of that government. If there's one thing the First Amendment was supposed to do, it was a, supposed to be one that allowed our citizens to criticize their own government. And yet, not only is it happening, it's happening in a manner that was designed for us not to see, because they're using the in, so-called invisible hand of the market, right? The, the fetishes that we developed 40 years ago, the slogans we memorized in 1980, back against us to be able to do what government could not otherwise do. You know what I say? If it is state action in disguise, then the Constitution still applies. And actually, these companies ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States if they're working hand in glove with the federal government to be That's That's not just a free speech problem on the internet. Okay, the free speech problem pervades the private sector as well. It strangles American workers. The number of workers who were fired in the last two years for saying the wrong thing on social media, for wearing the hat of the wrong political candidate, for saying the wrong thing even on their own time, going to the wrong political rally, it is staggering, it is unacceptable in this country. And you know what I say? I say that if you cannot fire somebody or deplatform somebody on account of their race, their sex, their sexual orientation, their religion, their national origin, then you should not be able to fire somebody or deplatform somebody on account of their political beliefs either. We need to make political expression a civil right to this country. Now, legislate it. I agree with you. Amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964. If we're the party of MLK, Number let's one, take that measure. We have to legislate across the country. I, do it in the states and do it in the federal federal government. Now, now, now I had a discussion. Uh, where's I, I just with you? What was, tell me your name again last night. Nick. Free Stater, right? Yes. All right. So Nick and I had a little debate last night. Okay. The debate we had was fun. We had, we had some fun debate. It got a little heated, but that's okay. Uh, we had a good fun debate. We need more of that in this country. We had a little debate last night. He says, "Okay, look." I'm a libertarian, and I don't want one more constraint on what private businesses can and can't do. The government should not be interfering in this, and the market should figure this stuff out. Okay, because if there are these silly businesses over here that are firing all these conservatives, that's an opportunity for these other businesses over here to hire them instead. It's, this is free market stuff. Okay, good. I, I, used to be, I used to be a libertarian, too. I get it. And it makes sense. There's, there's a lot of logic to that argument. But here's the problem. We cannot have it both ways. Either we actually trust the free market and we get rid of those protected classes altogether, or we apply the standards even-handedly. Say, if you can't fire somebody or deplatform somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or Hindu or whatever, that you should not be able to fire somebody or deplatform somebody just because they're an outspoken conservative, liberal, or libertarian either. America is not a country that forces you to choose between speaking your mind freely and putting food on the dinner table, between the American dream and the First Amendment. We are the quintessential nation on earth that allows you to enjoy both of those things at the same time. That too is part of what it means to be American. I say, what, we, what can we do? If we can do these things, 
If we can revive the answer to the question of what it means to be American, revive merit in who gets into this country, revive excellence in who gets ahead in this country, revive meritocracy through free speech and the ideas that get ahead in this country, rediscover the ideals that set this nation into motion, then and only then can we then rise to the occasion to face down the number one existential threat that we will face over the next decade ahead. And it is coming, it is already looking the sky, you'll already see it here on a given day, is the rise of communist China. We are in a codependent relationship with the CCP. Codependent relationships do not end well. The only question is who ends it first. The sooner we end it, the better for us. The later we end it, the better for them. And we have an opportunity to declare independence from China. I think that is the declaration of independence of 2024, when we declare independence from communist China. But Martha, thank you, thank you. But it's not gonna be all that rosy because it will involve some measure of sacrifice. Because we put ourselves in this position that we relied on them for the chips that power the phones in our pocket, the laptops that put this up on the screen, probably the, the refrigerator that kept that water bottle cold before you're drinking it. How we got here to rely on one small island off the southeast coast of China, the South China Sea, to power our entire modern way of life, I don't know. That's a shame for how we got here. I do know, but it's a longer story. But, <laughs> but the point is, it's going to involve some level of sacrifice. Okay? It's going to involve some level of sacrifice for our kids to tell them that if you can't smoke an addictive cigarette by the age of 18, then you should not be using an addictive social media product like TikTok before the age of 16 either, maybe not even at all in this country. That's going to involve some sacrifice to tell businesses in this country that you will not, and this is, I want to say this out loud really precisely because the Republican Party is, is, is under the control of a donor class that's not going to like me for saying this very much. I know this because a lot of them are, are my peers in the business world, okay? You cannot do business in China until the CCP reforms its behaviors, including intellectual property theft, including American user data theft, and other forms of state interference. That is a condition for any American business doing business in China until the CCP reforms its behaviors. That will involve sacrifice. To deliver accountability for the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic, using every financial tool in our arsenal to do it, including but not limited to looking at Chinese holdings of American debt. Again, that will take some measure of sacrifice. But I will tell you, giving up on this global climate religion, by the way, the same climate religion that shackles the US economy without laying a finger on China. For the believers in this religion, that will involve some measure of sacrifice. But we can muster the power to make these sacrifices if we know what we are making the sacrifice for. And if we can answer that question of what it means to be an American, then I think we can rise to that occasion, the occasion that America beckons for, not Chamberlain, but Churchill. That is our moment today. And I will tell you, we have spent the last decade in this country celebrating our diversity and our differences. While we forgot all the ways that we are really just the same as one people bound by a common set of ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago. From many, one. That is the vision that won us the American Revolution. That is the vision that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the vision that won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the vision that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that common vision over fractious group identity, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about, and that is what we're going to need to revive in order to save this great nation. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you.
So I've got to, I want to stay in touch with all of you, but you can't, give me, you can't get uh, your email addresses unless we do. So can you actually, um, if you want it, if you want to stay in touch, because there's more of this to come, and CBDCs and more. Uh, I'm going to give you a number to text. My first name is Vivek. V-I-V-E-K. How do you spell it? Two, two, eight, three, no. Two, two, eight, two, eight. Text me at 22828 and we'll stay in touch. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Crop tape.